Good. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. We're going to commence the meeting. It is the 5th of May, Salt Lake City Historic Landmark Commission. Uh, we do have a, a quorum this evening with Babs DeLay, John Uwinowski, Aidan uh, Lilly, uh, Kenton Peters to my left, Carlton Getz, uh, Michael Abrahamson is traveling, and Amanda DeLucia, our newest uh, historic uh, landmark commission uh, commissioner, welcome. And I'm, I'm Mike Vella. Um, wanted to announce there's a, um, this, this meeting is held in person, uh, so the, those of you who, uh, there is, there, there's a, a YouTube, www.youtube.com Salt Lake City live meetings. Uh, to listen to us, also Salt Lake City TV, Channel 17. If you're unable to attend in person but would like to submit comments regarding any of the items on the agenda, please email your comments to historiclandmarks.comments at saltlakecitygov.com. Uh, with that, uh, let's, uh, let's begin with the approval of the minutes for the 7th of April meeting. Commissioners, can I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion to approve those. Thank you, Kenton. May I have a second? I'll second. Very good. Uh, let's have a roll call uh, of the people here. Uh, Babs? Here. John? Abstain. Very good. Aiden? Abstain. Yeah, that's right, you were out. Uh, Kenton? Yes. Uh, Carlton? Yes. Uh, Michael Abrahamson was, is traveling, and Amanda was here, so um, I'm also in approval of that. That's, that's four, uh, so that, that those are accepted. Um, I don't believe there's a, I, I don't have a report from the chair. Babs, did you have a chair from the vice president? I didn't think so. And so uh, let's have a report from the director. Caleb? I'm over here now, everyone. Uh, the, you're further away. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome, Amanda. Can't wait to work with you further. I'm excited to have you here. And I just wanted to tell the commission, if you weren't there, some of you were there at the Preservation Utah Conference on Friday and Saturday, but it was a packed house, super engaging, great to be together. Um, and some uh, Kelsey and I had the honor to be on a Civics 101 panel just overall a great success. I just wanted to say thanks to Preservation Utah and everyone else. Um, another item that I wanted to cover was the, the June meeting for the Landmark Commission, and I know that you've been contacted just to see if we could have a quorum, but we would need an official motion to move our June 3rd meeting on Thursday to Wednesday, June 2nd. I'm sorry. The meeting's actually June 1st. I'm sorry. <laughs> June 1st, everyone. Please, an official motion for the right date. Thank you. So, Michaela, do we make that motion now? Yes, please. All right. Uh, so, commissioners, I, I believe uh, you've received emails uh, indicating that, and most people were uh, able to do that. So, let me entertain a motion uh, to move the meeting from scheduled meeting from the 2nd of June to the 1st of June. So moved. Second, please. Seconded. Thank you, John. Uh, let's go in order then. Babs? Aye. John? Yes. Aiden? Yes. Uh, Kenton? Yes. And uh, Carlton? Yes. And Amanda? Yes. And myself? Yes. Uh, so the motion passes uh, unanimously. So the next meeting will be on the 1st of June in lieu of the 2nd of June, like, like requested. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Michaela, any other items? Very good. I have right. one quick request, please. Can you please, when you speak into your microphones, put them very close to your mouth? Thank this you. This is still not close enough? <laughs> all right. Thanks. I feel like it's at the back of my throat now, so I'll try. All right. Um, so let's go, uh, I, I believe the, the next in order is uh, general public comments. Uh, very good. And so uh, we have a comment from Cindy Cromer. I know that we need to keep the ventilation system running full tilt, 
but it is really hard to hear you out in the audience. So please follow Aubrey's instructions about the microphones. It's the roar of the ventilation is considerable. Um, so first of all, I um, wanna remind you that the Preservation Home Tour, the historic home tour um, by Preservation Utah is the 21st of this month. That's a Saturday. There are multiple ways to participate as a volunteer um, or as uh, a ticket uh, purchaser. And you just go on preservationutah.org um, to find out more. Uh, and former chair of the Landmarks Commission, Warren Lloyd's office will be an adaptive reuse on the tour. That's a building that almost fell down before Warren took over. So, thanks. I have made some comments about your work session, um, and I've addressed the term limits, the ability of the chair to vote, Potentially what I see is doing away with the drop box. It's not clear in the draft. And I have several comments if you're doing away with the drop box because I'm very dependent on the drop box, as you know. And, and then I wanna talk in a little bit more detail about closing the public hearing and accepting new information. So it's not infrequent for the commission to close the public hearing and then in subsequent discussion in executive session, um, the commissioners come up with a request for more information from the applicant and the applicant returns with the information at a later meeting, but the public hearing is not reopened. In fact, the commission has refused to do so when a citizen asked to comment on an entirely new design. In the case of the Planning Commission, I've even seen a planner refuse to forward a letter submitted prior to a second meeting of the Planning Commission. I don't see that as fair. If you cannot turn the decision over to the staff, if the applicant has to return to the commission with additional information, then you should allow the public to comment on that information. I can't promise you that I always will, but it's very likely that I will because if it was hard enough for you to send the applicant back to the drawing board, it's probably gonna justify another comment from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cindy. Are there any other comments that have been received? Very good. We'll, uh, we'll close the uh, general public comments and um, begin our, our public hearing. Um, there are three, three items, uh, this, there's actually uh, four items this evening, um, a minor alteration, uh, rear addition at approximately 280 East 6th Avenue. There is the uh, Certificate of Appropriateness for New Construction at the Madeline Choir School and the Union Pacific Hotel New Construction Approval Modification Request. I will recuse myself from item number three, the Union Pacific uh, hotel new construction uh, as, as, as our office is working on that project and I will return for other business. So we'll, we'll proceed in that, that order. So I um, believe um, we have uh, Amanda Roman. Very good. Thank you, Amanda. You're up. Thank you. All right, um, I'm presenting a minor alteration for a rear addition at 280 East 6th Avenue. The applicant is uh, requesting a certificate of appropriateness to build a rear addition um, on the subject property. The addition requires um, the following zoning modifications, uh, an increase in maximum lot coverage, increase in maximum building and wall height, and a reduction of side yard setbacks. Uh, staff is recommending approval. Uh, the subject property is located on the south side of 6th Avenue between B and C Street. It is a contributing structure to the local um, Avenue's historic district. The zoning is SR1A. Um, the property is about 4,200 square feet with a lot width of 30 feet, which allows for reduced side yard setbacks. And the property is similar in dimension to um, other properties at front 5th and 6th Avenue. There's a detached garage at the rear of the lot and it's shared with the property owners of 277 North C. Um, there's an access e easement off of C Street. 
existing conditions. Um, the applicant's proposing to remove a non-original sleeping porch from the rear of the structure. Uh, this existing structure is not compliant with the maximum building coverage and side yard setback standards. And the existing dwelling is brick with a stone foundation. The new um, rear addition would increase the non-compliance. And the roof of the principal structure is hipped with a 912 slope. The proposed addition would have a gabled roof with a lower slope of 612. Uh, the addition would be stepped down from the original structure due to the slope of the lot. Um, the proposed addition will be clad with a f smooth fiber cement lapboard siding. And um, the roofing material and window types will match the original structure. The addition will not be visible from the public right of way due to that slope. Um, picture the front of the home, which will not um, not be changing, and then a, a elevation of the proposed addition. Some site photos of the subject property. Um, on the left one, you can see the uh, rear addition, the existing addition um, coming off the back of the house. Some more photos of the subject property. Okay, so go into the modifications. So um, the maximum lot coverage in the SR1A zone is 40%. 40%. The existing structures cover approximately 45% of the lot area, and the applicant is requesting um, an increase. The proposed addition would cover approximately 54% of the lot area. The maximum building height in the SR1A zone is 23 feet, and the maximum wall height is 17 feet. The applicant's proposing a maximum building height of 25 feet 2 inches and a maximum wall height of 17 feet 10 inches. I outlined the section of the roof that would be um, uh, above the 23 feet. And then uh, the wall height is also shown. The uh, typical side yard setbacks in the SR1A zone are four feet on one side and 10 on the other. Although um, there is a calculation in code when the width of the lot is less than 47 feet. So when that calculation comes into play, the subject property side yard setback requirement is four feet on one side and five on the other um, because it has a narrow lot width. The applicant's requesting a reduced side yard setback from five feet on the east elevation, which is shown on the bottom, um, the bottom of the site plan, and then as well as a reduction in the required 10-foot building separation between the subject, um, the existing home, and then the property to the west. They are requesting about nine feet. And the western side yard setback would be four feet, so that is compliant. Um, other considerations, the addition will not be a uh, visible from the public right of way. It is supported into the original structure and steps down in, due to the slope of the lot. It's consistent in scale and character and it meets the residential historic guidelines in chapter eight. Um, and as stated before, staff is, uh, based on information in the report, staff's recommending uh, approval of the petition PLN HLC 2022-00200. I'm happy to answer any questions. Very good. Commissioners, questions for staff? Right. Thank you. Next we'll hear from the applicant. I believe it's David Richards. I expected some Cinco de Mayo festivities tonight. I'm severely disappointed. <laughs> I'm Dave Richards. I'm the architect who's been hired by the owners. This is Rebecca Sears and Paul Stratton. I think Amanda did a great job on our staff report. It's very thorough, explains all the issues, so I don't really have a lot to add. I think with the addition, like a lot of those lots that are narrow, we always have height concerns, property coverage concerns, setback concerns. It's just sort of the nature of our current zoning regs in relation to these older subdivisions. We've tried to be very sensitive to maintaining the integrity of the existing house. So changing the roof pitch in the back so it's lower rather than matching the existing helped with that. 
And the fact that it slopes down tends to hide it from view so it doesn't really affect the streetscape. Probably the, the roughest comparison is the, the slide you showed with the uh, house to the west, which is very close to the property line and very big and bulky, and we're sort of the antithesis of that, I believe. So mainly I'm here to ask questions, and if you have anything for the owners that can respond, we'd be happy to answer that. Very good. Commissioners, any questions for the applicant? Self-explanatory, huh? It, it's, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. Yeah, and um, sort of our opinion. You know, I, I agree with you that, that the uh, side um, dimensions were tight to begin with, and what you're doing is following the, basically the footprint of the existing building further further to the south. Right. Right. Yeah, we've been set a little bit on both sides, trying to at least get one of the setbacks legal, the four-footer, and then the other one that's like three and a half, three foot nine, and it's supposed to be five, so we're, we're close. Fair enough. So I don't believe there's any other questions. So I, I believe at this time, let's open for public comments. Thank you. Thank you. There's not been any, any public comments? I haven't received any comment cards. All right, well, very good. Then let's, uh, let's close the uh, public hearing for, for this. And now let's uh, move into uh, executive session. Uh, commissioners, are there any any questions, any comments that we have concerning this this request? I'm, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and start in, in order. Uh, Amanda, I just had a comment um, regarding the slope in the property. I, I appreciate the fact that it is um, away from the public eye and that it is sloping down despite the increased height. So I think that's a nice element. Yes. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think there's any other issues. All right, then uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'll ask for a motion, please. I will make the motion. Uh, based on the findings listed in the staff report, the information presented, and input received from the public hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the minor alteration petition, PLNHLC, 2022. 00200 as proposed, subject to complying with the conditions listed in the staff report. Very good, thank you. I'll you have a second, please? I'll second that. Thank you, Aiden. Let's, get, let's vote in order, please. Uh, Babs? Aye. John? Aye. Aiden? Aye. Kenton? Aye. Carlton? Aye. And Amanda? Aye. And very well. And so the motion pass, passes uh, unanimously. Thank you very much, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's move now to the second item on the docket this evening. I wish they were all nice and tidy. So nice and tidy and <laughs> All right, let's move to the second, and this has to do with uh, the Madeline Choir School Fieldhouse. No, we can't do that to Nelson. What a, what a <laughs> blissfully unaware of what you guys are plotting here. Good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, this is a request by the Madeline Choir, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Uh, request by the Madeline Choir School to construct a new uh, principal building uh, on their campus at approximately 67 B Street. Um, you reviewed this proposal at your last meeting in April and uh, tabled it um, in order for the commission to, or excuse me, in order for planning staff uh, allow us additional time to review new, new information that was submitted by the applicant. Um, 
the, the primary things that we were looking at was a determination if the pr proposed design meets the base standards of the institutional zone in which it sits, and if any of those standards would require modification from the Historic Landmark Commission. Um, it, there were two aspects of that that we uncovered. Uh, then a uh, discussion of additional details on materials, the fenestration pattern, window details and profiles, and then uh, finally we had to do a little research on the, uh, the, the proposal in terms of off-site and shared parking, uh, the arrangement that they've made with the, um, the church on A Street and their, their parking lots. So this is not only the standards of the compliance, but the things in red were uh, things that required the additional research that uh, entailed another month of review, and I'll go into those a little more. Key considerations here. Um, the second avenue entrance, um, the, the applicants have supplied us with additional information on window locations, uh, full elevations of the entire building, um, and then window details, profiles, um, they're all in your staff report. Uh, and they also clarified the intended use of the entrance. Um, and as shown on this uh, detail of the site plan, um, they, pr they propose to include one uh, accessible ADA stall as this drop-off point for their early childhood learning program. Um, that requires a modification from the commission to reduce the front yard setback on this side. Ordinarily, it would be 20 feet. Um, this would reduce that setback to zero. That would be where the building line is. Um, and there is an existing parking lot that extends past that, uh, that uh, setback line. Uh, that wouldn't ordinarily be allowed. When we did some research, we found that there was a 1986 uh, Board of Adjustment case that allowed that. So there, yes, I, specifically for this um, this parking lot. Uh, that, and it was the same situation, allowing uh, parking in a in a required setback. So here where they're um, going in with a similar footprint, um, the, the space will be reconfigured so that it is primarily pedestrian in nature, but it will have that one accessible stall. It won't be a, a drop-off point where cars are coming in and out. Um, cars will queue up on the second avenue side. Um, we, we find, as outlined in the staff report, that the details of this proposal uh, meet the standards for new construction or this aspect, and that we recommend that you approve this modification to the front yard setback. Uh, the second area in which we needed to look a little closer was uh, the proposal involving um, putting a play area on the rooftop of the new gymnasium. Um, you can see that outlined in red here. Um, the original proposal in order to keep the height of the building down below the maximum 35 foot height was to have that safety screen at uh, about four and a half feet. Um, that, that seemed reasonable uh, given that at most of the locations the, that, sa that safety screen will be set back 10 to 15, even 20 feet from the, uh, the wall of the building. So kids aren't gonna get that close to the edge. Um, upon further discussion, uh, they have proposed to raise that to um, an eight foot total. That would uh, require another modification to the, uh, the limits of the institutional zone, uh, raising the, the height of the building from 35 feet to 38 and a half feet total. Um, hey, considering, considering the setback, and you can see here the, the, a, a little more detail on the netting. This is a photo of the, the same type of uh, protective screening that is used 
uh, at Judge Memorial Catholic High School on their uh, building or on their football field um, just off of 11th East. Uh, this, this photo shows a much higher screen than would be proposed here. Uh, it would project approximately three and a half feet above the, the parapet wall. So what's the total feet from the ground? 38 and a half. To the top of that net? Yeah. Okay. So the, the height is measured to the top of the net. Um, it, we detail it more fully again in the staff report. We, we would recommend that the HLC approve that modification as well. Um, finally, a quick discussion on materials and design details here. Um, the, the, in the discussion, you had a previous work session in January, and then in the discussion in April, uh, there was talking about more variation on the, the wall planes and uh, more specifics on the um, polychromatic uh, it, in some areas, such as the gymnasium wall, that is going to be a window, it's going to be a glass uh, a window. Uh, on the north side, the Second Avenue side, those will be um, a fiber cement panels in the same color palette. Um, here, with the additional information, our finding remains the same, that um, the, the proposal meets the standards in terms of materials and in wall planes. So our recommendation doesn't change there. Uh, so we get down to our final recommendation, um, and that would be that the Historic Landmark Commission approved this request, and the two associated modifications, one to maximum building height and one to the reduced front yard setback, uh, we would add or suggest this condition that you delegate final design details to the planning staff. And now I am open for questions and comments. Very well, commissioners. There was just a single item that I had and it had to do, and I think it was just a detail and it had to do with uh, ADA uh, and or a van accessible and it had it was talking about the width of, of the side space that's that's in your purview we'll, you'll take care of those kind of details yeah there. and um, we we sent the their their design for the the parking space on second Avenue and also there I, I didn't get too much into the uh, the the parking um, but the the off-site parking the transportation division has reviewed that and um, there is some restriping that will be necessary in order to accommodate those stalls, um, but that would be part of the project as well. Right, and, and zoning didn't have an issue with that because there was an agreement uh, with the parking that was across the way, and as you say, there was some restriping you know, to accommodate the accessible spaces, and that was it. Correct. Okay. 10 points for you for reading the staff report. <laughs> <laughs> I always do. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, commissioners, any other questions for Kenton? I have a question regarding the parking agreement with the church and the guarantees for long-term agreements there, um, given the general lack of parking or the, the challenging parking in the avenues itself. Yeah, and that, that was certainly an issue at the uh, April meeting. There was uh, a lot more public comment. There were people here in person. Um, the, the zoning code has, has two requirements for parking agreements. One is for off-site parking um, and one is for shared parking. Um, in a shared parking agreement, they require, and correct me, um, a five-year minimum agreement. And if they're using off-site parking uh, it, to in place of um, required parking that would ordinarily be on site, that has to be an agreement that's recorded with the county recorder and that runs in perpetuity with the land unless that parking is then relocated elsewhere down the road. Uh, so it, it does end up as a legal document that's recorded and that would be part of the agreement here something that we don't necessarily get too much into because it's a zoning issue, but um, 
certainly worth discussing. If I understand this correctly, and I think I do, the onus is always on, on Madeline School to provide the required parking. And Correct. if indeed the parking that they have now, either in shared or, or in off-site parking, if that goes away, then they're going to have to do something with parking. I think that's, that's how, how these agreements then work. Yeah, if there were uh, a development down the road um, that, that someone wanted to do on that lot, then uh, they would have to work with the school in order to either accommodate that parking on the, on the site or uh, the choir school would have to find the required parking in another space. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the project before us does not change the parking requirement of the choir school, neither increase it nor decrease it. So that's really completely moot. That's correct. It, it actually, um, it would increase the required parking based on the additional uses assembly space, um, but it doesn't, the, the parking that was, the, the initial parking calculations that they supplied assumed that the, the parking for the school itself was, we would figure it according to the regulations now. Uh, and so they, they did the calculations based on that. The, as we researched it, we realized that this, this property's use as a school goes back to predating any sort of parking requirement or, uh, you know, uh, it was even 50 years before the first zoning ordinance in 1927 when this, when this property became a school. So um, in our calculations, that, that figure then went down to zero. So, so net, there's actually a reduction, <laughs> um, but there would be more required parking because they are adding that assembly Nelson, space. Nelson, I can just jump in. So. Uh, commissioners, if you reference the table found in attachment D, the zoning standards, you'll see a clear off-street parking and loading analysis, and they are complying with the parking requirements based on that analysis. That's the easy answer. <laughs> Very good. Commissioners, any other questions? Thank you. So um, open this up now for an applicant presentation, if any. Well, see, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Nelson, commissioners. Um, Nelson's presentation was very thorough. I think covers all the points um, that I was planning on presenting tonight. I mean, just, I guess, quickly on parking, and I think that got touched on at the end, was that ultimately when we completed the shared parking analysis, we found out that less parking was required than what we initially presented. Um, the Second Avenue ADA stall, I think, how we were seeing this was really, this allowed the campus to retain the same level of accessibility that it currently has, which seemed important to us. Well, and you top screen, the additional height, we tried to keep this as minimal visually as possible and more about safety for students. Um, so yeah, thanks for your consideration and I'm available to answer any questions. Very well, thank you. Can anyone? Nate, yeah. when you address any questions, will you speak into the microphone? Oh, Thank sorry. You. Commissioners, any questions? I, I had one question. On sheet 19 of the staff report, there's an elevation that shows the roof and the safety screen wall. 
it, it notes it as four six and then eight foot. And I'm assuming the eight foot is the dimension based on what was mentioned before with a three foot six parapet that looks to be about 15 feet in front of or further to the edge of the building from where that is. Given the height of the building and the slope as you hit um, well, that B Street, B Street. I believe, mm -hmm. and right. how much of that screen wall is anticipated to really be visible from the street? None, and that was the idea of pulling that back 15 feet from that east facade. That's exactly right, and actually 10 feet from the north and south to help with that as well. Very good. Uh, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Let's uh, now open the public hearing concerning this. No? Very well. Then let's close the public hearing, and uh, let's uh, let's move into executive session then. Commissioners, we've seen this. This is the third time now, so I think yes. I think we're familiar with with all of the the issues. Um, I know the, the questions that I had have been answered. Kenton, your question. Um, I th my questions have been answered. I think things are well resolved. It's uh, well. Uh, I don't have any objection to it as presented. John, Aiden, Anna, John. All right, very good. So um, let's entertain a motion, please. I'll make a motion. Got it open here. Based on the discussion, analysis, and findings in the staff report and staff memo, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission approve petition PLNHLC 2021-01074, which is a proposal for the new construction of a gymnasium classroom building on the Madeline Choir School campus, with the condition that final design details are delegated to planning staff. Included in the approval are the following zoning modifications. One, exceed the 35-foot maximum height in the I institutional zoning district by approximately three feet six inches to accommodate a safety screen for a rooftop play area. Two, reduction of the required 20-foot front yard setback to zero feet to accommodate ADA parking where a parking lot currently exists on Second Avenue. Thank you, Kitten. Second, do, please. Do we want to add that condition of approval that Nelson had recommended for staff to be able to make the design review? It, 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 yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the condition final design details are delegated oh. to planning staff. Sorry, okay, perfect. What, what we're approving is the certificate of appropriate. Okay. Very good. Okay. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you. Let's uh, vote in order, please. Babs? Aye. John? Aye. Aiden? Aye. Kenton? Aye. Carlton? Aye. And Amanda? Aye. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Chair is going to recuse himself. Vice Chair stepping forward regarding Number three on our agenda, which is the Union Pacific Hotel new construction approval modification request. Kelsey Lindquist from the city will be presenting. Kelsey. Thank you, Commissioner DeLay. Just give me one moment. All right, good evening. This is a request from Amir Tursik that uh, <laughs> the applicant to modify the approved design and materials for the major addition new construction to the Union Pacific Railroad Station. The Historic Landmark Commission approved the project in May of 2019. And since that approval, the applicant has been working with staff to satisfy the various conditions placed on the approval. 
A subsequent building permit was submitted for a core and shell. Uh, during that review, staff noted several discrepancies between the approval and the submission. Staff determined that the modifications were above our purview, and the commission is tasked with reviewing these requested changes this evening. Okay, just as a reminder, this is the west elevation of the approved plan set. And we'll, I'll get into the requested modifications. The requested changes include the, a change of the primary building material from a brick veneer to a thin brick, a change from the ground floor material of natural stone to metal wall panels, a change to the western elevation recesses and fenestration material from metal to glazing. Uh, this slide illustrates a rendering of the revised western elevation. And it also highlights the removal of the louvers that were on the previous approval. That will be clearer on the next slide. So this is a flat elevation of what was approved. The red box illustrates the removal of these louvers. Louvers, I don't know. Um, Those four? They were a good design feature, from what I understand. So this was what was approved. This is the change that they're seeking. A clearer rendering. You'll see the uh, red arrows point to the new metal paneling for the ground floor. The removal of the uh, central bay uh, louvers, and then a replacement of the metal paneling on the recessed fenestration with glazing. Uh, this slide highlights the areas of requested change for the uh, fenestration recession. It's um, these angled on the left. You'll see what was approved, which was a fairly deep recess. And then on the right, um, it's slightly more flush with the building. It still has that sawtooth design, just um, slightly less dimension. Okay. And then a continuation of these changes, the applicant is also seeking a, a change in the soffit height, which was approved at 18 feet. Now they're seeking a, a range of 16 to 17 and a half feet of that soffit. In addition to this change, the applicant is also seeking a material modification on the eastern elevation from what was approved to be metal to an ephus, and then a change of the fenestration pattern as well. The fenestration, um, is just to change so that there's more consistency in window sizes. So this is what was approved. There was metal banding in a horizontal pattern between each floor. They're seeking to replace that with an ephus. I'm sorry, there, could, could you go back just course, real quick between the two? This one? And yeah. Thank you. Of course. There is a height increase of approximately 11 inches. The approved design was approved at 99 feet, and upon their submittal, they have increased that building height 11 inches. Included in this submission was the sign package for the new development. It includes a marquee sign of approximately 60 square feet in size that will go on the historic Union Pacific building on the eastern elevation. And then a monument sign sited on the eastern side of the site just to the south of the entrance of the Union Pacific building. Here is an image of that monument sign. And then as well as a building sign that will be located on the western elevation of the new building. All of the signs meet the applicable sign regulations. And based on that, our recommendation is that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the requested changes with the conditions noted in the motion sheet. 
Do you have questions for Kelsey, commissioners? If not, let's go ahead and get the applicants. Commissioner DeLuca, did you have a question? I wasn't sure if I was, this was the appropriate time, but my understanding after reading the report was that the modifications to material were based on cost. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And the applicant can go into further detail about that. Great. Let's have the applicant come on up. Thanks, Kelsey. Of course. You're going to have to shove off there. <laughs> leave it Leave it on that pretty picture. That's good. Oh, oh, well, I'm just, there we go. There okay. we go. All righty. Introduce yourselves, please, to the commission. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Emir Tersek with HKS Architects. Good morning or good evening. <laughs> Shannon Herringer with the Athens Group. Make sure, and, oh, make sure you're, you're just talking right into these things. And Eric Peterson also with the Athens Group. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. I'll try to uh, keep this as close to my mouth as possible. Um, uh, we're really excited to be here in person. It's been almost three years to date that we got this approved. And uh, following the design development completion, um, kind of a delayed uh, almost spring of 2020, the project went on an 18-month hold. Uh, due to obvious reasons, uh, the pandemic hit the hospitality industry probably harder than most. Um, we have restarted the project last summer. Uh, we just submitted the last uh, construction documents permit set to the city, and we're really excited to get going. Um, I'd like to point out that majority of the changes, and you're probably going to have a lot of questions because we have quite a few, um, for the most part, are really a result of design evolution as much as we try to be diligent in the concept phase as we go through the schematic design, design development, construction documents, things inevitably evolve. But there are definitely a couple of items that were a result of the uh, supply chain issues as well as unprecedented construction cost escalation. Um, and the last thing we wanted to present is the signage design, which was the, the conditional approval. So uh, this is just a summary of changes that uh, Kelsey has already walked us through. Uh, we'll try just to maybe elaborate a little bit the reason for the changes and uh, from our perspective as the design and project team. We've worked really hard to maintain the integrity the, of the design despite all the challenges along the way that we have encountered. Um, this is the approved uh, west elevation, and this is kind of maybe a, a little bit more graphic summary of the material changes. And Kelsey already covered the deletion of the fins. They were primarily a decorative element. Um, we were hoping that it would actually provide more solar heat gain uh, shielding, if you want, on the western facade, but they were primarily blocking the views out of the window, so there wasn't really a whole lot of value in them. Um, as far as the brick is concerned, we replaced the brick veneer with the exact same color, um, thin brick. We'll show you a picture. Uh, we made sure that we're using thin brick with, that has pre-manufactured return corners so that there is no visual impact. Uh, I mean, once it's constructed, no one is going to be able to tell whether it's brick veneer or thin brick. And um, we enlarged the windows. That was primarily driven by um, the experience of the guest room or the guest room sizes, and we'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, and then the last two issues were the um, uh, changes of the base from stone to metal panel. Um, and that was actually one of the changes that was affected by the uh, supply chain issues. We initially specified very white Turkish limestone that became unavailable even before the pandemic. And so we, had, we looked at a variety of other domestic stones that didn't quite fit the palette. So we actually wanted to specify a material that would be complementary of the rest of the facade, which is the reason why we picked the metal panel. Okay. Um, this is not, this is a very durable three millimeter aluminum panel, very similar. Actually, we use it on the addition to the Capitol Theater that some of you may be familiar with. So it's a very high quality durable material. It's, uh, and it's impact resistant. Um, and then the last item on this, uh, it's the EFA soffit. Um, as you can tell, we have a very dynamic facade. As we got deeper into details, we realized that metal panel, which we originally specified in the concept phase, doesn't really lend itself to that kind of articulation. EFA as a monolithic material was more appropriate rather than having a lot of little pieces of metal. Um, 
so this kind of represents the current design that Kelsey went through. I'm not sure that we need to elaborate much more on that. Couple of things to point out. These are the sections through our base. Our base is primarily glass because we wanted to have a visual connection with the street and really activate the street around us. So the metal panel that we, rep the stone that we replaced with metal panel is actually a very small portion of that facade. Um, on the east facade, uh, there is Couple of changes, thin brick we already talked about. We introduced a metal panel band around the openings. And then same reason as on the other side, these kind of deep window soffits were initially metal as well and we proposed to replace those with EFAS for the same reasons. This is just another rendering, um, uh, a newer rendering if you want of the final design and we feel that it very much captures the original design intent. Um, the reason for the portal reduction, before I forget, is um, the approval said that we were trying to uh, maintain estimated height of 18 feet, but as we again um, develop the design further, we have guest rooms up above the portal and on both sides of the portal, so we have drains coming out of the guest rooms. We also have hydronic piping that's crossing that portal, which is the reason why we ask for the reduction. I'd just like to point out that the main soffit area, I don't know if I can operate this mouse right here, it's 17 and a half feet, so it's only six inches lower than the originally approved, and then we have a little soffit that runs on both sides of the portal that comes down to 16 feet. Um, this is just a summary of the materials that we described, the aluminum plate and the thin brick material, as well as the EFAS that we're proposing. In terms of the articulation, um, these were primarily driven by design um, evolution. Uh, Kelsey already kind of alluded to, you can see on the left is what was originally proposed, and on the right is our current articulation. Um, <coughs> I'd like to point out that we're still maintaining a very um, articulated facade. This is about two and a half feet, and then we have an additional foot recess at the windows. Um, one of the things or challenges we ran into as we started detailing the design is that these triangular shapes are really hard to flesh out and maintain the integrity of the waterproofing. And we also wanted to give a little bit more space to the guest room itself because the guest rooms are fairly small and we have had a lot of standards to comply with. So that was the primary reason for that change. Um, it may be worth pointing out that the, the, the two and a half foot um, recess that we were showing in the approved design was actually a varying dimension. It wasn't consistent. So it was going from a few inches to two and a half feet and now would be one foot consistently across the face. Um, on the east facade, the only change is really uh, the new window size. As we started really coordinating the, the requirements of the guest rooms and the uh, brand standards with our exterior articulation, we had to introduce an, another window size that's basically the window into the bathrooms to maintain the privacy. Um, we still maintain the vertical stacking of the same window, so it's hard to tell, but there's two different window sizes that repeat themselves, but the rhythm is still there, so we don't really feel that it takes away much from the final design. And on the building height, um, the reason why we had to uh, request, uh, uh, made a request for additional 11 inches was for the elevator overruns um, and the structural requirements to support them. And the only thing I'd like to point out that that 11 inch increase is limited to the two elevator towers here and here. And we still managed to maintain our building height within the maximum approved building height for the gateway as well as below the Mansard ridge line, which was our intent. We, uh, one of our goals was that we never exceed that height. Um, there's a small change to Harpscape. I'm not sure that it's really germane, but since we have, we can show you. Uh, this didn't get stuck. Sorry about that. Maybe I can just use. Um, originally, our design proposed to use concrete pavers in the drop off area for the hotel right here. Um, we changed that to concrete. We maintain the same design, but for durability, um, to be able to sustain vehicular traffic. This is also our uh, fire department access now. Uh, we thought that a better long-term solution would be to change that to concrete. Can you go back the slide before yeah. that, the one with the picture? Sorry. The next, back, one back. more. No, the east side view of the Union Pacific. The rendering, sure. Okay, it's actually forward, but it's jumping back and forth on me, I apologize, here we go. 
Um, so that's all there right now. Where's your port to get people, your drop-off area is where Flemings has been the drop-off area? Correct. Well, that's going to be a nightmare. Hmm. Well, <laughs> that, that is actually part of the hotel property. Right now, it's kind of no man's land. It's right. just part of the sidewalk, and Valet uses it for yeah. cars, for the jazz games. Once this, once the hotel is open, this is going to be operated and regulated by the hotel staff, okay. right? And one of the things we wanted to do is make sure that we create a demarcation between the sidewalk and the hotel property, if you want. We also worked really hard to clean out the jungle of light poles and flag poles that are detracting from the building and replace that, which is really part of the signage package that we're showing now. Um, there, there, there is really no changes to the signage package that we originally proposed. Um, we actually simplified and reduced the number of signs, um, and it was the last conditional approval that needed to be approved by the landmark historic landmark commission. We are relocating a few of the existing signs because we have to accommodate the fire department access to the building, which currently is non-compliant. Mm. Um, and then the, the basically the two new exterior signs of the east elevation is the main hotel sign. They will be replacing the gateway sign. And it's a new monument sign for the hotel that's actually replacing a marquee sign that used to be the old urban outfitters, if you remember. And again, we felt that the low monument side sign was a more appropriate solution that doesn't detract from the historic character of the building like it currently does. Um, I don't know if, if you'd like us to go into the details of the materials. All the signage complies with the CD ordinance. We have worked really hard to pick the materials that are complementary of the historic building. Um, and they both illuminated, so they fully integrated in terms of architectural design as well as the uh, lighting design. Uh, we only have one sign on the um, west elevation, which is illuminated, Asher Adams sign that you see on this rendering. Again, still within the... Um, uh, sizes that are uh, limited by the city ordinance. And that's the end of our presentation. Great. Commissioners, questions? I had a couple just that have nothing to do with the historic. One is, how many rooms is it going to have? 225. 225? 225. You said the rooms are very small, but you're certainly going to have a lot of suites, yes? Uh, rooms are not small, but if you want to dive into it, the hospitality, urban hospitality projects, the rooms are getting smaller and smaller. So we're at around 325 square feet, which yeah. meets the Marriott standards. But you'll have a lot of suites too, right? We do have presidential suites and executive suites in the historic building as well as in the new tower. That's so great. great. And um, you said the supply chain, so you, you were going for limestone, but you went for metal. Metal was actually cheaper than limestone? or you just couldn't get it? Uh, yes, Lime, the metal is cheaper currently, I mean, aluminum That's crazy. is cheaper. Okay, There's a that was my rando question, sorry. No worries. <laughs> Anybody else? I just had um, a few questions on the material. So on the proposed metal material, what's the ref reflectivity on that? I would not be able to give you the exact reflectivity in okay. terms of percentages, but uh, it's going to be coded with a matte color, so it's not going to be extremely reflective, oh, if that's matte. concerned. Okay. Right. And that matte color would be the bronze? It's the bronze, right. Okay. It's the same color, so I'm trying to go back to that rendering, as the rest of the metal on that elevation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the eaves, that would have more like a plaster type finish to it on the exterior? Correct. Okay. And it would be a very small percentage on the east facade. I think it represents around 4% of the overall material palette. Other questions, commissioners? Uh, hearing none, let's go ahead and uh, see if there's any public comment. Do we have any? I have not received any comment cards. All right, then. So we will close the public hearing, commissioners. We must talk amongst ourselves. Thank you all very much. Any comments, commissioners? If not, we will go ahead and vote. Yeah. I Yep. My comment is just that I don't think any of these changes uh, 11 inches make, make any, any difference to the no. uh, design we proposed before. It, it looks good. It's let's get so started let's on it. It's been years for these guys. Too. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and vote. Uh, we'll do this um, here in executive session now. Uh, John. 
Yes. Robert? We need a motion first, I oh, think. Oh, we need a motion. Oh, <laughs> look at me. Could I have a motion, please? I've got it up in front if, if <laughs> don't mean to take this over, but uh, uh -huh. okay. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented and the input received or the lack thereof during the public hearing, I move that the Historic Landmark Commission approve the requested new construction major alteration PLNHLC 2018-00616 with the following condition. Final details of the requested changes be delegated to staff. Second. Second. Great. All right. Now that it's been s made the motion and seconded, let's go ahead and vote. John. Yes. Aiden. Yes. Kenton. Yes. Carlton. Yes. Amanda. Aye. Aye. And my, I say aye too. Motion passes. Thank you all. Let's get started. We're waiting for you. My office is at the gateway. His office is the gateway. We're waiting for you. Come on. <laughs> Get on it. All right. We have other business now. Uh, our chair may come back in. This is an update to policies and procedures. Policies and procedures. And we got some information from Cindy Cromer uh, at the beginning of the meeting on uh, her thoughts on policies and procedures. And I will turn this over back to... Commissioner Vela. Hello, everyone. Let's talk about policies and procedures. Um, yes, we do, um, because in the uh, 2022 Utah legislature, a bill was passed that required us, or any public body that's holding electronic meetings, um, to make some changes to policies and procedures to, yes, to determine a quorum. Actually, it really clarifies things. Um, determine a quorum and voting when members are attending electronically. And so with the assistance of our attorney's office, there is a marked up draft and we have done so. So we made We've made just some minor, minor changes to what constitutes a quorum for an electronic meeting. Uh, we added a statement that if a commissioner has to recuse themselves, the recused commissioner still counts towards the quorum. I mean, I'm thinking of the Elks Project when we had a number of commissioners. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen all the time, but yeah, that's problematic. So now if one recuses themselves, but they were still at the meeting, um, we can count them towards the quorum. Uh, the city's attorney's office has recommended, well, we kind of had the question of why doesn't the chair vote? And I don't think anyone really had a, a clear idea why the chair doesn't vote other than the chair is facilitating the meeting. Um, so the proposal that's marked up is that we remove that prohibition and allow the chair to vote, um, the chair voting at the end at of the, the roll call. Right. Um, so it doesn't look like the chair is leading the vote necessarily. Thanks, Aubrey. Um, and then some other minor changes, certainly I think a typo on page five that Cindy brought up. What about the term limits? You know, in term limits, let's discuss term limits. So the policies and procedures actually don't address term limits. Generally, you vote every year on who is the chair and the vice chair. So if I could provide a little background on that, your policies and procedures in a, a former time um, actually did limit the chair's term to, um, to one year. And we had a circumstance, I don't know if you were here, Michaela, where uh, Warren, Warren Lloyd was the, the chair of the commission and everybody really liked Warren, thought he did a great job, and nobody else wanted to serve as the chair. So they amended the policies and procedures to allow consecutive years of, of uh, chairpersonship. Um, you're Kenton certainly- Kenton as well. Kenton as well did it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, go ahead. Right. Sorry, I didn't mean to so, interrupt you. So, so, so Cindy has a good point. It, it would be good to have uh, different people um, serve. Sometimes people aren't willing to and- um, 
And honestly, sometimes we have so many new commissioners. I mean, that could be a circumstance right. too, but it's up to you all. If you want to change it back to a, a one year limit for the chair, that's your prerogative, you can do that. What's our term limit for being a commissioner? Four years? Two terms for a piece. Four years a piece. Eight years. Like Four years. Eight years total. If Eight years total, okay. yes. Yes, sir. Uh, I, now, given these points, I would agree because sometimes people don't want to be chair, and so you end up being chair for a couple of times. So I'm not sure we need that necessarily. I see both sides of it but I don't feel real strongly one way or the other, but it's a good point that Cindy brought up. Is there a medium where we do like a two year term as chair rather than a one year? Yeah, that's what I was year thinking. That if we were to institute any sort of limit, it wouldn't be just one year. It would be some period of time longer than that. Mm -hmm. two? I'd be in favor of two. I would as well. Yeah. I like that I idea would too. And I, and I would just say that with two years, a new member coming on board, it, 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 and speaking for myself, you're probably faster than I am, it takes a little bit of time to, to, to get and understand the rhythm of, of the meetings and such. And then once you do that, you know, uh, two years does make sense to me and then pass, pass the baton on. Uh, and then, you know, in that two years time, then, then new members, and I'm, I'm looking at people that I expect to be chairs in the future. That, that they would, you know, know and understand that and be able to step in, you know, very easily. So I, I would, I too would be in favor of two years. But vote on it each year. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, with a maximum of two years. Yes. Right. Okay, two yeah. consecutive years. Yeah. Great. Right. Yeah, because what if they were bad? Okay. You want them out. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's <laughs> correct. Uh -huh. There's that too. Yes. Right. Um, There's what, that too. Okay. What about the um, doing away with the Dropbox that she recommended you know we we're not doing away with the dropbox the dropbox is your dropbox and so um so before we publish the report any public comments that we get in are are within your staff report they're included in your staff report when we have other comments that come in we email them to you and upload them to the Dropbox. We're not doing, we don't plan to do away with the Dropbox. It's not public facing. So we make sure that we email it to you or print it out like I did tonight mm -hmm. if it comes in late and our admin team is, is down here preparing for the meeting. Well, Michaela, it's, I mean, it's nice to have them, but if you get them you know, the day of or the night of that, right. the meeting, so, you know, there's not 50 of them, there's usually Two or three, five maybe. Yeah, so it, they're not a a big issue. Yeah, it's not a crushing issue, I don't think. Right, and it's. But I mean, she the also same. brought up that are we allowing people like right before the meeting to submit information? Are we getting that information? Right. That's that's a valid point. Yeah. I've never had a problem planning or this commission to not get the when you get the information, you give it to us. I've never had a problem with that. It's never a surprise. Mm -hmm. Forward information to you. Yeah. That's absolutely kind of your job. Right. Have you That's right. And with legislative items, we forward them I to you and the council. A non, a so non -issue. we <clears throat> might we might have in a couple of times, you know, that something fell through, but because it was very last minute. But I, you guys have been really good about oops, this is last minute. It's right here on your desk. Read it now. We do our best. I know that. Um, and Let's see what else. So we can go ahead and add a two-year maximum. We do want you to vote on it. I can go ahead and do that. One more addition. Oh, do we need to have this done by June? Or is it July, changing the policies and procedures? I don't recall. What? I don't remember. I think it was June last year. Pardon? We had it done by June last year. No, I mean, what, did the state legislature require us to have it by July? I don't know. 
I don't recall. <laughs> Do you mean, okay, or, or you can vote on it tonight if you trust us to put in a max, maximum and I bring it back and we could change it again next meeting. How about that? I think one should be for this. You need to bring you, it back. But there, well, there, I just want one question. I mean, what, what's written, there's really just two items on there, what constitutes a quorum and, and the voting and how the voting ought to happen. Those are really the only two substantive changes, correct? Yes. And if you were wanted and, to and we can, add we term can limits, add the term limits to, to indicate that the chair would be a, a two-year term limit, but we would vote on a yearly basis. Yes, sir. Okay. And the chair can vote. Correct. Huh? But last. Last. Every, everyone votes Both first last. and then the chair yes. will, will, okay. That's reflected in this track changes right, right now. The only thing I'm hearing so far that would be different from what's in the draft in front of you is the oh. term limit. It would add the third item concerning term yeah. limits. Yeah. So, commissioners? I, I, I mean, I'll ask our attorney. We're allowed to take that direction. And, and I think what Babs is asking is, do we have to come back with track changes? Or you, can we take that direction? No, you don't, you don't, I don't need. I mean, <laughs> you have to place a little bit of faith in Michaela, though. She, she might change it to something else. Um, <laughs> we, you do not have to have the exact text in front of you tonight. Um, I'm sure that Up you would feel comfortable with that, but if you feel like Michaela and Kelsey or whoever's going to be making that actual change will take your direction, um, then we can go. We don't need to bring it back to a later meeting. Uh, what we could do is after those updates have been made, if you're not satisfied, then you can ask to have it put on a following agenda, agenda to where the verbiage is exactly like you prefer. Your call. I'm fine either way. And uh, honestly, I, commissioners, it, are we in agreement? Yes. I mean, it's really three things. Two that, that was in front of us, and the third is the term limits. Yeah, but so we just need the language right now to make a motion to vote on that? Is that what we're looking for? We if would we need were? a motion and a second. Yeah. Okay. So we would need to craft a motion. I didn't think there. I don't think there was one in the report. We can help you with that. I mean, it, yeah. the motion would basically to be to adopt the policies and procedure amendments as provided to you, along with an additional amendment um, to cap the uh, term of the chair at two years. I second Paul's motion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm incapable of making a motion, but you can say something like what he said, right? What, what Paul said. I, I would say that while it would be nice to move it off the agenda from a procedural standpoint, I think it may be best to have a final written version that we simply adopt at the next meeting so that it's very clear as to exactly what has been adopted. I, w I would support that uh, as well. Or an alternative would be to make the changes that are in the what's in front of you now, and then we could do an additional policies and procedures update at the next meeting. Lots of options. Thank you, Paul. That's right. All right. We've heard, a couple of us have asked for it to be written out, so please proceed write it out, and we'll go through it exactly as you uh, wrote it and take care of it next time is that right however you prefer I believe that's what, uh, that's what, what Carlton I think. would be a couple be. different things yeah. but whatever you whatever you prefer we will, clarity, we will take like your direction we'll in writing. Put it in yeah. Writing, yeah yeah no. done great beautiful thank you folks that's all we have very well then I believe will, will, will you add to that the commissioner should be uh, issued a gavel I'd love to add that in. No I've no hidden meeting. the gavel. What? How, how large should the gavel be? <laughs> All right. A plastic, a giant red plastic gavel or a wooden? We do have a gavel in this room.
Yay. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful night.